All right, turning your Bibles to James. James chapter 1, we're going to dive into there. Last Sunday, we talked about the importance of a knowledge of the Word of God. We're walking through this series that we're calling On Your Mark, right? On Your Mark. And, uh, and we're talking about the marks of a disciple. Because our mission, our summit at Summit, the thing that we're trying to summit to is disciples that make disciples. Disciple making disciples. And so um, we're looking at the marks of a disciple, hence on your mark. And so we're looking at the marks of a disciple. And so we looked at a passion for Jesus the first two weeks. And last week and this week, we're looking at a knowledge of the Word of God. So I've titled today's message, Living According to the Word of God. So the way that we're going to start this, the way that we're going to set this up today is, how many of you know what this is? What is it? It's a mirror. It's a dusty mirror. Uh, Wow, okay. All right. It's a mirror, right? And, uh, and, and so this is a mirror. What do we do with a mirror? Check ourselves out, right? We check ourselves out. Not bad. Okay. Considering Kristen was on the ladies' retreat this weekend and she wasn't home this morning to, to help with this, I'll take it. All right. So um, we check ourselves out, right? And, and, and for a lot of us, for a lot of us, and what I'm hoping to get to with this message today is a lot of us have more than one mirror in our lives, right? A lot of us have more than one mirror in our lives. Um, I, did, I did some research recently um, um, for some of my summer talks, and uh, can you guess how many times, how many times a, a guy looks in a mirror in a day? One, two, A- on average, on average, now, now looking with the intent to like fix something. Now, when we're brushing our, t- right, we might glance in the mirror. It was less than one. On average, less than one time a day, right? And ladies are like, yep, that makes sense. Judging by what I see, that makes sense, right? Um, okay, and, but, but for, for ladies, let's just say it was more than that. Okay, it was more than that. Okay, a couple more than that. I think actually for ladies, for girls from the age of 14 to 22, young ladies, 14 to 22, more than eight times a day. More than eight times a day. Isn't that interesting? More than eight times a day. So, not the point. The point is, we have many mirrors. For example, I don't necessarily look in the mirror every day day. Um, kind of what you see is what you get. Um, and, but, but I have four mirrors in my life that whenever I'm around them, I can tell you exactly how I am. And their names are Bria, Micah, Ezra, and Vera. Every time. I can tell, I can tell by the way that my children respond how stressed I am, how, 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 how rushed we are, things like that, um, and, 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 and all of that, right? So we, we have friends that are mirrors, right? And they mirror back to us different, different things, right? And so we have many mirrors in our lives. And that's what I want to talk about today because our goal, our goal as a disciple of Jesus is to have the Scriptures, have the Word of God, have the Word of God be our mirror. That we examine ourselves according to the Word of God. Not culture, not Facebook, not Instagram, not this, not that, not friends, not, you know, not co-workers, n- nothing else, but that the Word of God would be the mirror that we see ourselves from. So James chapter 1 is where we're going to jump into. We're going to look at verses 19 through 27. So if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along, you can... Look at it on your phone, your Bible app. You can check it out on the screen. Know this, my beloved brothers, James says. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to be angry, or slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word 
and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and is not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Can I pray for us? Then we'll dive in. Father God, thank you so much for today. God, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather around your word this morning. I pray we don't take it for granted, but I pray that we lean in today to hear what it is that you want to say to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I believe according to James and what he said here, right, which, which let's, let's get this out of the way real quick, we know that James is the half-brother of Jesus, right? James is the half-brother of Jesus. And so um, he, he gets a short book. I wish that his book would have been a little bit longer and he would have told us what Jesus was like in his younger years. I wish he would have told us that time that he back-talked Mary. I wish he would have told us, you know, I mean, I, wish, I just wish we could have seen something from the half-brother of Jesus. Like, hey, the Gospels are great, but let me tell you about the real, let me tell you about the real, you know, the growing up Jesus, right? Uh, I, but but he, gets, he gets a few short chapters here, and they're jam-packed with goodness. They're jam-packed with goodness. And here in James chapter 1, we see that, 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 um, what James is talking about is to be a doer of the Word, right? To be a doer of the Word. And we see that we have three, in these, in these seven or eight verses, we have three responsibilities to the Word of God. The first thing that we have a responsibility to do is to receive the Word. Receive the Word. He says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness, rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness, receive with meekness the implanted Word which is able to save your souls. Now, we could spend a month just talking about these verses. Just talking about these verses. Slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to anger, the implanted Word. We could talk about that, receiving it with meekness, right? We could spend a ton of time talking about that. But I want to try to fly through this because I want you to get all three uh, responsibilities that we have towards living with the Word of God. And so when it comes to receiving the Word, if we're going to receive the Word, then we've got to follow the instructions that James gives us here, right? The first thing he gives us, quick to hear. Quick to hear. Quick to hear. Romans 10, 17 says this, that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Just as a, just as a servant is quick to hear his master's voice, or, or think, about, think about the mother who, who, who hears the smallest cry right we'll be we'll be sitting um we'll be sitting watching a ball game and all the kids are in bed and 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 i'm focused on you know tom brady going down and and scoring on the winning drive or something like that and and kristen's like what was that i nothing like not what what was what are you talking about she's like turn it down sure enough sure enough one of the kids like got up and you know, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, right? And mothers are trained to hear the smallest cry or the smallest noise. We should be quick to hear what God has to say. We should be quick to hear what God has to say. And one of the things we talked about last week is that God will meet you at the level of your expectation when it comes to the Word of God. God will meet you at the level of your expectation when it comes to the Word of God. I can't, I don't know about you, I don't know about you. People say, people, people that do studies and do statistics and stuff like that, they say that people make up their mind on how they feel about the sermon before they even walk into the sanctuary on a Sunday morning. People, people say, people that do studies and all that stuff, people say that before you walk into the sanctuary, so before you entered this room, people have made up their mind 
about how they feel about the message. You know, but by the by the parking lot, you know, by the children's, by the greeters, you know, all of those things. Um, you know, did, did they hand me my bulletin correctly or did they hand it to me backwards, which, I don't, which I'm not even sure what that would look like, right? But I'm sure we've, you know, we could find an issue with that, right? Right? Is, are the people dressed appropriately? Are the people, is the coffee good enough? Is the coffee warm enough? Is the coffee, you know, all of that, which we got stand the man on the coffee, which is just awesome, faithful here every Sunday morning to, to make that coffee. So um, I, I think he's better than Starbucks. But anyway, Sorry, Josh. But people make up their mind. And, and so I don't, I, but, but man, that, that's just so foreign to me. I got to be honest with you. I read that statistic, I read that article, and I'm like, that's crazy. Because, man, I wake up on Sunday morning, especially when I'm not preaching, um, but, but I get to come and be here and sit and take notes. Or when I wake up elsewhere, I, Russ and Ian and I are going to a conference in Dallas um, uh, the, the, the end of this month into the 1st of November, and I can't wait to hear a couple of those messages because I've already seen the titles and I've already seen who's speaking. Man, I can't wait. We were talking about our itinerary the other day and what, what you know, what, what we were going to do and where we were going to be and where we were going to go and all of that stuff. And I said, well, one thing's for sure. We cannot miss this session right here where this guy's speaking about this because I can't wait to sit and take notes and to see what God says in that session. Man, I can't wait to be gathered with God's people and to hear the Word of God. I have a friend, I have a friend who, who is in India right now teaching pastors. It takes them six hours to gather because they have to gather in secrecy. But they can't wait to get together. And I think, oh, that we would have a fraction of the passion to be together around God's Word that they have in India. That we wouldn't sit and say, oh, I could have communicated that better. Oh, that story was ridiculous. Oh, this or that. And we, and we nitpick. Or, or you know what? Or you know what? We go to a ladies' retreat and we make up our minds before we even show up on Friday that this is going to be the most ridiculous way to spend my weekend. And so we miss all that God has to say through the weekend because our attitude got in the way. And we weren't quick to hear and slow to speak. That's the second one. First instruction, quick to hear. Oh, that we would have a fraction of the passion of those pastors in India to show up and risk their lives. I've wondered. I've wondered. I've wondered. And we can't go too far with this, mainly because we don't have time. <laughs> but I've wondered how many of us would still be here on a Sunday morning if we had to risk our lives to be here. How many of us would still come? How many of us would still show up? If there was something on the line, how many of us approach hearing the Word of God together in that way, with that passion, with that level of dedication. Something to chew on. The second instruction that he gives there, slow to speak. We'll hit these a little quicker. Slow to speak, although when you think about it, we have two ears and one mouth, right? That ought to remind us that we should listen more than we speak. I read, I read this past week, I think it was a, something that was going around and and, 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 and so many of us, so many of us, we just, we just can't wait for the person to stop talking because all we're thinking about is the thing that we're going to respond with instead of listening. Instead of actually listening to hear what the person is trying to say. James says, be quick to hear, slow to speak. Number three, slow to become angry. I know none of us wrestle with anger, so we'll fly through this one. James warns us against getting angry because, guess what? It reveals our sin to us. He warns us against becoming angry because, guess what? It becomes a mirror in our lives and reveals some things to us. Like the man, uh, like the man who, who broke 
the mirror because he disliked the image that he saw in it. We rebel against God's word because it tells the truth about us. And then lastly, he says, he says, with a prepared heart, and we've kind of talked about this a little bit, he says, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. James saw the human heart as a garden. If left unto itself, the soil would only produce weeds. He urges us, he urges believers to pull the weeds and prepare the soil for the word of God. How? First, Confessing our sins and asking God to forgive us. Secondly, by meditating on His love and grace and asking Him to break up any hardness in our hearts. I'm not ignoring that there may be hardness in our hearts this morning. But what does it look like to walk in here and say, okay God, in these next few minutes, while they're playing the first song, while Jeff's playing on the piano before the service starts, God, can you break that hardness in my heart? God, you know that I'm thinking about this experience this morning. Would you just break that in my heart so that I can hear your word? And finally, he says, receive it with meekness. You know, meekness is the opposite of anger. He says, slow to anger. Meekness is the opposite of anger. When we, when we receive God's Word with meekness, we accept it. We don't argue with it. We, 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 we hold it up to our lives as a mirror. We honor it as God's Word. We don't try to twist it or conform it to our own thinking. We receive God's Word with meekness. Slow to anger. Slow to speak. Quick to hear with a prepared heart. We've got to receive the Word of God. The second responsibility that we have towards the Word of God is to practice the Word of God. Receive the Word of God. Practice the Word of God. He says there in the middle of the passage that we read this morning, verse 22, but be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. It isn't enough to just hear the Word of God. We have to do something with it. It isn't enough to just hear the Word of God. We have to do something with it. I've had so many conversations with people this past week that said, you know what, on Sunday morning when you said on a scale of 1 to 10, what's my relationship with the Word of God? That made me think a lot differently about my relationship with the Word of God. I was sitting talking with one person and I'm sure they wouldn't mind me, me sharing, but, 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 but they left church on Sunday and, and they came to me and they said, you know, you know, it kind of woke me up. It was a big wake-up call because I'm a zero. I'm a zero. My relationship with the Word of God right now is a zero. And I attend church every week. I'm at church every time the doors are open. They don't even attend here, so don't try to figure out who it is. Mm, who's, mm, mm, no, probably not. Maybe, mm, no, no. Because that's what we do, right? But he said, I'm a zero, and I just, want to, I, I just want to get to a one. So I'm going to try to figure out right now how I get to a one. I said, well, what are you going to do? And we had a great conversation about it. We had a great conversation about it. But it's not just enough to hear the Word of God and say, oh, that was, that was, you know, that was a good message. That was a great message. It was really funny when he did this. I didn't like it when he did this. We've got to do something with it. We've got to do something with it. Don't be hearers of the Word deceiving yourselves. Be doers of the word many of us make the mistake and we talk about this all the time here of thinking that hearing a good sermon or a bible study is what makes us grow but it's not the hearing it's the doing that brings the growth and the blessing it's the doing that brings growth and blessing too many of us I saw this saying this past week I'm not sure who originated it so if you're quoting it you can just put Travis too many of us mark our Bibles, but our Bibles never mark us. Too many of us mark our Bibles, but our Bibles never mark us. If we go back to the mirror, our dusty mirror with a smiley face here, we'll give him some hair. Okay? A dusty mirror with a smiley face and some hair. Um, if we go back to the mirror, what a mirror is good for? We talked about it a little bit, right? To check ourselves out. James says for examination, that when we look in a mirror, we examine ourselves. This is the main purpose for owning a mirror, to examine, to examine, to look at and be able to see ourselves and make sure for some of us, 
that we look as clean and as neat as possible. Things are put together, right? We're put together because, well, we're put together, right? And so James mentions several mistakes here in these verses that we make as we look into the mirror. Number one, we just glance at ourselves, right? We just glance, right? We kind of we walk by. For some of us, we walk by as quickly as possible, right? Just to get a glance. We just glance. They merely glance at themselves. Uh, secondly, they forget what they see. Right? We look in a mirror, we walk away, we forget, right? For some of us, me, that's the best case scenario. Number three, when it comes to the mirror of the word, we don't do what the word tells us to do. We just walk away, we've glanced, we forget. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So number one, we've got to receive the word. Number two, we've got to practice the word. Number three, we've got to share the word. We've got to share the word. Share the word. So he talks about here, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So, so here's, where, here's where this message gets a little fun. Here's where this message gets a little fun. Because this word, religion. I, I don't typically like the word religion. People throw that word out there a lot for many different things. But as I did my studying over the last couple weeks for this message with this passage, this word religion is a little interesting. This word religion shows up three times here, five times in the rest of the New Testament. Every other time that it's written, that it's translated, it's translated with the word worship. It's translated with the word worship. So what James is literally talking about here is not our approach to a set of beliefs necessarily, but a lifestyle. Because how many of us know that, re- that worship is a lifestyle? Let, 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 me, let, me, let me just tell you something. Worship, worship isn't something that we just come and do for four songs on a Sunday morning. It's not. Worship isn't the music. Worship is a lifestyle. In fact, as I was praying with our worship team this morning, back in my office, before we got out of here, I prayed and I I hope that for all of our people, for the people back there in the soundboard, for the people that are clicking the arrow, for the people that that are singing and playing and doing different things, I pray that every part of what happens here on a Sunday morning is out of the overflow of our worship throughout the week. Everything that happens here is an overflow out of our worship. So if you, if you read it that way, if anyone thinks uh, he's living a life of worship and doesn't bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's worship is worthless. Worship that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. He doesn't say anything there about singing songs. He talks about a lifestyle. To visit orphans, widows, in their affliction, to keep oneself unstained from the world. So this word, literally, religion or worship, as it's translated in some places, means this, the outward practice and service to a God. The outward practice and service to a God. To a God, pure worship has nothing to do with ceremonies or special days. Let me say that again. Pure worship has nothing to do with ceremonies or special days. Pure worship means practicing God's Word and sharing it with others. Pure worship means practicing God's Word and sharing it with others. When's the last time you shared God's Word with somebody? When's the last time you shared with someone what you were getting out of the Scriptures? What God was doing in your heart 
through his word. And he says a couple ways we can do this. In verse 26, he says, If anyone thinks he's religious and doesn't bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. The first way that we can share the word of God is in our speech. James, again, the half-brother of Jesus, he talks about the tongue, he talks about our speech a lot already in, in chapter 1 here. I think this is the second or third time he's bringing up the tongue because he believes, and I believe, and, 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 and I think it's true, the tongue reveals the heart. If the heart's right, the speech will be right. If the heart's right, the speech will be right. And then secondly... Secondly, look at verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. We share the word in our service. After we've seen ourselves and Jesus in the mirror of the word of God, we must see others and their needs. We must look to others and their needs. Words are no substitute for acts of love. Words are no substitute for acts of love. So my question for you is this. My question for all of us this morning is this. Because I'm sure as we thought about, if you're, if you're anything like me, if you, if you thought about the message last week on a scale of 1 to 10, if you weren't here on a scale of 1 to 10, what is your relationship with the Word of God? Just very simply. On a scale of 1 to 10, what is your relationship with the Word of God? My question for us this morning is this, because for many of us, I'm sure we walked away and we thought, yeah, but, you know, I, I do this, or I do that, and we tried to justify, and we tried to make excuses, and we tried to do this, we tried to do that. My question for us this morning is this, what excuse do you need to take away to have a closer relationship with the Word of God? What excuse do you need to take away so that you can live your life according to the Word of God. Receive the Word, practice the Word, share the Word. What excuse do you need to take away? I mean, think about those three. Think about those three. Take those three right there. How are you at receiving the Word of God? How are you at practicing the Word of God? How are you at sharing the Word of God? What excuse do you need to take away in your life so that you can do that, so that you can do that, so that you can have a closer relationship with the Word of God and live your life accordingly to God's Word. Many of us, many of us, this is why this is important, many of us are trying to summit at a disciple-making disciple Many of us are trying to do discipleship. We're trying to figure out discipleship. We're trying to figure out what this, this whole thing looks like. And we're forgetting the playbook. We're not... Mm, all right. Two minutes, Chad. I'm on the two-minute two minute clock, Okay. Let me just finish this thought, and then we'll jump into communion. When I sit down with someone and ask the question, hey, what are you getting out of God's Word? What I want to hear is what Jeff's getting out of God's Word. I don't want to hear, because I've been guilty of this. I've been guilty of this. So I'm preaching, I'm preaching to the, myself here as much as any of us. I don't want to hear what God gave Deirdre that I'm going to steal. So that I can just go off Deirdre's inspiration because I'm making excuses for spending time with God on my own. You see that? 
There is nothing like, when I talk to guys, when I talk to guys about preaching, when I talk to guys about preaching, I used to think that I needed to go and watch, I mean, this is back when I first started preaching. I would go and listen to 10 messages and hear what God was inspiring other guys to do. And I tried to imitate that. And then one day, one day, I was reading, preparing for a message, prepared a whole message like I had before, and I'm talking, this was like 12 or 13 years ago, before I knew Maine existed. Got up to preach, and my notes were nowhere to be found. Now, as a speaker, that is one of the most terrifying things ever. So you know what I did? I had five minutes, Anita. Took my Bible. Said, okay, what is God teaching me from this passage? And I wrote it out. And it was transformational in my teaching. It was transformational in my preaching. I was more passionate about God's Word than I ever had been. I was more excited about God's Word than I ever had been. I preached longer than I ever had, which for me was awesome. Bria looked at me last night. She said, Daddy, you know, you really preach for a long time. I said, Bria, I just get so excited about God's Word. And she kind of rolled her eyes and she said, yeah, I know. I can tell. Is that bad? Like, is that wrong? Like, Bria, so now I'm trying to read my 10-year-old about, is that... Man, there is nothing like you getting set on fire with a passion from the Word of God. Don't imitate mine. Don't imitate Jeff's. Don't imitate Zan's. Don't imitate Dylan's. These are all folks that that have on fire relationships with God, and it's awesome, and it's great to be inspired by them. But man, dive into it for yourself. Because as we transition to communion this morning, there is no communion with the Father. There's no communion with the Father. I was going to say there's no communion with the Father better than the Word of God. But you know what? There's no communion with the Father outside of the Word of God. If we're going to talk about communion with the Father, doing life with the Father, communion, being in union with God, we have to be in His Word. And so as the folks that are going to come and help me serve communion this morning. Our worship team is going to come and get in place. There's going to be some movement in this moment. But as they're doing that, as they're doing that, I want you to think about what are the excuses that we're making when it comes to living according to God's Word? And what does it look like? What does it look like? What does it look like for us to kick a couple of those excuses to the curb so that we can live according to God's Word and get closer to our summit? Quick to hear. Slow to speak. Two ears, one mouth. Slow to become angry. With a prepared heart. Receive it with meekness. That's my prayer for today.